Now let's talk about the structure of the IETF. Here's a pictorial view of it, showing the Internet Society at the top, uh, the IEB on the, on the left, and the IESG on the right, and areas and working groups within those areas and other things. We'll go through each of these pieces. First of all, the work of the IETF is done in working groups. Got lots of working groups, more than 100 working groups. Uh, each working group has one or more chairs. The chairs manage the work in the working group itself and adjudicate against uh, discussions and consensus determination and things like that. Within the working group, we also have document editors who are responsible for ed editing individual working documents and producing material for the to be reviewed and be published as RFCs. So lots of working groups. For managerial efficiency, the working groups have been organized into areas. It's not, it's not a particularly strict division. The working groups show up in areas where they might not logically sit because the, an area director, which is the manager of the area, is interested in the topic. So there's a general division, so security area has those, those working groups that are mostly working on security, but other areas may have working groups that, are, that seem outside their area, but still they're there, and that's, that's just the way it is. The number of areas changes from time to time. Areas get merged, they get separated, split into different parts, that sort of thing. But an area is made up of a bunch of working groups. Each of the areas has one or two or three um, area directors. They're jointly responsible for managing the development and health of the, of the working groups within the area. Um, they re review, the area directors review documents that the working group thinks are ready for standardization or publication. Uh, the technical areas all have two or three area directors. There's a general area which worries about across, across IETF activities such as intellectual property rights and that has one area director, the IETF chair. Area director is responsible for managing what's going on in the area. They can sponsor birds of a feather sessions, uh, they can propose working groups, they work the working groups through the IESG to cause the working groups to be adopted. They make they watch watch the working group activity. They have to sit in the working group meetings or listen to the working groups ver, uh, sessions if it's a virtual meeting. Uh, and they basically keep track of it, make sure the working group doesn't go off track, gets work done, doesn't exceed its uh, charter, and things like that. Make sure that the working group's following the right process. The working group chair is adjudicating consensus properly. Area directors do have the, uh, the authority to change working group management, document editors, or working group chairs. It's a pretty ugly situation. I've done it when I was an area director, but it's pretty ugly. and do it very rarely, and you usually need a lot of backup from the IESG to say it's worthwhile, because the person being swapped out generally doesn't believe that they're doing a bad job, even if they are. The IESG, Internet Engineering Steering Group, is made up of all the area directors plus the IETF chair. And it's a multi, it performs as a multidisciplinary technical review group. A proposal for, for publication as an RFC is, is moved up by a working group, it's handed off to the area director, the area director reviews it, may send it back to the working group for more work, but then when the area director is satisfied with it, hands it up to the IESG. IESG then evaluates it, does a technical evaluation a cross-jurisdictional technical evaluation. This is something different than most standards bodies. Most standards bodies, all of the technical decisions and all of the technical review is done at the lower level, at the working group or working party level. The IETF, we've got the second layer of technical review. Security people review the proposal for security. Tech, uh, transport area people review the proposal for congestion control and things like that. The management area people review the proposal for manageability. So this is a cross-area technical review. It can be pretty brutal. The working group might never have really thought about security, and that comes. the document gets to the ISG. The security people say, send it back because it's not ready for prime time. So uh, this is a late-in-the-game return to the working group. But it's an important quality control, something that I think the IETF does better than about any other standards bodies. The ISG is the body that approves documents for publications, particularly our standards track and uh, informational RFCs that are 
come out of working groups or come out of individual submissions within the IETF. There are other processes by which RFCs can be, can be produced, uh, the IAB or IRTF or an independent submissions uh, process. The ISG reviews any documents which are proposed in the independent submissions process in order to ensure that they're not end runs around the IETF process itself or that they are not somehow countering the IETF process. The ISG manages the entire IETF process, so it decides what uh, working groups get created, they decide what areas exist when they want to merge or, or bifurcate areas, they create the working groups, they create the working group charters, they're part of the appeals chain. If you have a problem with what a working group chair did, you can appeal it to the ISG. Um, and it includes, the ISG in, includes, in a way, the IAB chair uh, and a liaison from the IAB as, as ex officio members of the ISG. They don't have any votes. The ISG sort of semi-votes. It, it, uh, it expresses its, inter its um, reviews of individual documents in a uh, quite rigorous way, and if any particular area director objects to a document being published, then that document is held until the area director is satisfied. There is a fallback process which the IESG can decide that it's just one area director being recalcitrant and can force a, a special review situation where it takes more than one area director to block the publication of a document. But mostly, the IESG works on a consensus basis. If they're generally in favor of the document, it gets published. The Internet Society is a nonprofit organization. It was created in 1992 by Vince, Vince Cerf and others to pro provide a legal umbrella over the IETF and to continue Larry Landweber's developing country workshops. That's Larry pictured there. These workshops brought people in from all over the world to learn how to do this Internet thing. It was it, it was active between the early 1990s to late 1990s, trained people all over the world on how to configure routers and how to set up networks. And the ISOC, the Internet Society, was set up in order to continue that process, which it did for many years. ISOC today has large numbers of corporate members, which are organizational members, individual members, anybody can join as an individual, and would I urge you to look into doing that if you're interested at all in, in, the, in the theory and the maintenance of the internet itself. And it has chapters, chapters in many countries. Uh, those chapters are collections of individual members that have local meetings and things like that. If you work for a company that's in the internet space, talk to them about joining the, the Internet Society as an organizational member. The Internet Society is the today the legal and process and budget home for the IETF and support of the Internet Society is support for the IETF. The ISOC's mission is to promote the open development, evolution, and use of the Internet for the benefit of all people throughout the world. Bintserf came up with that uh, as mission statement quite a few years ago. Although the Internet Society was formed in 1992, it took until 1996 for the IETF to agree to come under the legal umbrella was a very long, contentious um, working group process to decide to come under the umbrella. Uh, there were various reasons not to. Uh, there was a belief that the Internet Society was sort of trying to steal the IETF's glory, uh, or that the Internet Society itself wasn't fairly organized. Well, some of those problems were worked out. The organization of the, IET, of the Internet Society was changed slightly. Uh, to something that was seen as more fair. And with the publications RSC 2026 and RSC 2031, the IETF agreed to become a organized activity of the Internet Society. And that's the way it's expressed on the IETF webpage, is that the Internet Engineering Task Force is an organized activity of the Internet Society. The IETF doesn't legally exist on its own. It's only this activity. So the I, ISOC is now the, basically the home for the IETF. It does all of the legal issues. It uh, provides insurance. Um, it's a home for the IASA, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, the ISOC trustees are another part of the appeals chain. 
uh, the IAB got chartered by the Internet Society, and the ISOC president appoints an OMCOM chair and sits in on the IAB calls and is part of the IAB mailing list. The IETF, through the IAB, appoints four of the 12 voting members of the ISOC board. The IAB, which used to be the, the uh, standards approval body in the IETF, is now really, it ar provides architectural advice and oversight, general oversight. If not, it doesn't command things. Uh, it just gen generally provides good, uh, good oversight. Deals with uh, external liaisons, appoints IRTF chair, which we'll talk about in a bit. Uh, it selects the portion of the IANA, which we'll talk about in a bit, that's relevant to the IETF. And it appoints and oversees the RFC editor, which does the actual RFC production. The IAB is chartered uh, by the ISOC board and advises the ISOC board on technically related issues. Uh, the IAB gets a slate of uh, area directors from the nominations committee uh, to, for the IESG. And the IAB does the approval process for that. So they review that slate and decide whether they want to agree with the slate or not. And if they don't, they push it back to the NOMCOM to come up with other candidates. The IAB is a mid-step in the appeals chain. The bottom step is the, well, I see the bottom step is the step at where the issue occurred. So if you have a problem in the working group, then you appeal to the working group chair, even if the, you're appealing an, a, a um, decision by the working group chair. If that fails, you appeal to the IESG. IESG. And if that fails, you, you, know, you can appeal to the IAB. And if you think the standards process itself is incorrectly specified, not how it was executed, but whether the actual specification in 2026 is proper, if you don't think it's proper, then you can appeal to the ISOC Board of Trustees. But otherwise, you can't. You can, the end of the appeal chain is the IAB. The IAB advises the ISG on working group part formation and working group charters. It doesn't have any. It doesn't have a controlling influence. It just advises. And the IAB convey, convenes many topic-specific workshops, mostly by invitation only but looking at routing, the future of routing, or security, or mobility, or lots of other things they've done over the years. And they write up the uh, results of those workshops. The IAB activities generally are organized into programs. The programs include IAB members, but also non-IAB members, and that's to ensure continuity as the IAB changes. The, every, every two years, uh, some members of the IAB get uh, swapped out. Uh, every the terms of two years, but uh, many will continue on for a couple of years, but then a couple of terms, but then get swapped out with others, and you want some continuity. So they set up the programs to ensure continuity as IAB members change. The IAB also sponsors and organizes the IRTF. Speaking of which, the IRTF is a parallel organization to the IETF. Notice in the picture I showed you in the, at the beginning, the IRTF is not seen as part of the IETF. It's a parallel organization, and it looks at topics that aren't yet ready for standardization. These are long-term process uh, projects. We had a research group for a long time on spam. We know we can't actually control spam, so it's a fine thing for research uh, because there's nothing ready for standardization yet. There's a lot of research groups, and they're managed by an R the IRTF chair, who is selected by the IAB, and an, I an Internet Research Steer Steering Group, which is selected by the IRTF chair. The Internet Assigned Numbers Authority, the IANA. The IANA was created many, many years ago. It was originally one person. One person agreed to coordinate the recording of the parameters that were used within the then ARPANET protocols. There's a value in the header of packets that say this, what the packet carries. The packet may carry remote login information. It may carry email. It may carry streaming audio or video. There's a value in there, a parameter that says this packet contains email. The, there's a number in that parameter value, and it does make a difference what the number is as long as it's consistent. 
If I send you a packet with the number 25 in that, in that field, that means email. It intrinsically doesn't mean email, but everybody has agreed this means email. In the very early days of the ARPANET, they decided that somebody needed to write down and record what these values are because they had to be consistent. They're, they're arbitrarily assigned, but they have to be consistent, and everybody has to agree on them. So John Postel agreed to be the keeper of the numbers, the keeper of the, the parameter values. And he did that, and he was anointed the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority as part of that process. Then when the, when the Internet switched from the old ARPANET protocol, NCP, to TCP IP, you had to have somebody who was going to manage the assignment of IP addresses. So it, originally that was John. Uh, when I needed addresses for Harvard, I sent John email and said, I need some IP addresses. And John wrote back and said, well, here's the block of addresses that Harvard can use. It was a nice process, but it was John. John wrote down who got what blocks of addresses. John, as the IANA did. Now, these days, the uh, address assignment to the end users, such as Harvard, is not done through the IANA. It's done through regional IP address registries. So the the, the IANA assigns big blocks of addresses to the regional registries, and the regional registries then assign blocks of addresses to their customers, which are mostly Internet service providers and sometimes end sites such as Harvard. And so there's regional Internet registries, different jurisdictions, there's five of them around the world, and you can see the map here is showing different ones in different places. So the IANA assigns these blocks of addresses to the RIRs. And finally, when it became clear that the use of IP addresses to tell people where to get information or to send email used to be that I'd tell somebody, you go to, ad, to IP address 128.103.8.36 to get this file. That was the IP address of the machine that I was running that made some information available. That didn't scale very well. I wanted to be able to change the IP address of a machine so, so I couldn't, I'd have to go and contact all my friends to say, well, I just changed the address, so use a different address. So Paul Markopetrus came up with this concept of a domain name system, which puts a layer of abstraction between the, the actual IP address and the address that the user uses. Now you use an address such as harvard.edu or www.harvard.edu, and that's this layer of indirection that is then mapped with the domain name system into an actual IP address or set of IP addresses for that, to, for that particular machine. Somebody needed to maintain the database, which was the top level of the DNS, and John took that over too. So John was now the IANA, which was working with protocol parameters, with IP addresses, and with domain names. The IANA is very old. It goes back to 1969, so it predates the IETF for a very long time. The IETF does have a relationship with the IANA, uh, and that's with a memorandum of understanding. Uh, the IANA function moved from John to ICANN uh, back in the early part of the uh, early 2000s uh, because John wanted to get out of that business and also because John died right around then. So ICANN is now performing the IANA function. The U.S. government is constantly reviewing that, but at the moment ICANN performs the function and there's an MOU between the IETF and ICANN for performing the protocol parameters portion and only that portion of the IANA function. The RIRs, the Internet Re Regional Registries, and the domain names folks have their own relationships with IANA that are not, not related to the, the IETF. When you write an internet draft to become an RSC, you have to tell the IANA whether there's anything that the IANA has to do, like assign a new parameter. So there needs to be an IANA consideration section in all internet drafts that are going to be published as RFCs. That consideration section can say, no IANA actions required. The graph here, the picture here is from RFC 5226, which tells you how to do that kind of assignment. Uh, the Internet drafts, when they're being reviewed by the ISG for consideration for publication as RFCs, 
are reviewed by the IANA to, decide, to determine whether there's any IANA actions required. There is an IETF secretariat. The secretariat is a commercial organization. Uh, it's the only part of the IETF that's, been, that's paid directly. All of the other folks are volunteers. Uh, the IETF ran a RFP process, and the folks that won the RFP to be a secretariat was the Association of Management Solutions of Fremont, California, and they managed the, the normal day-to-day -day operation of the IETF. They run the mailing lists and run the conferences and run the websites and things like that. All of the day-to-day -day activities of the ISG, uh, it's all run by AMS. Uh, there's There'll be a RFP put out at some point for because the AMS has had a couple of extensions on their existing contract for a new one, and we'll see what happens with that. The IETF Administrative Support Activity, the IASA, was set up by RFCs 4071 and 4371 when the, I, uh, the IETF agreed that the Internet Society was going to be the financial home as well as the legal home for the IETF. The IASA has no authority over the standards process itself. It's a separate group. It's housed within the Internet Society. All of its members are volunteers except for the administrative director. The administrative director is as an employee, Internet Society employee that reports to the IASA whose job is to work about, worry about the IETF's normal operations. There's a video here you can look at about uh, the IASA and how it, how it works. One of the primary functions of the IASA is to develop the budget for the IETF. It also deals with, figures out where, where the IETF should meet, face-to-face -face meetings. The budget uh, is developed on an annual basis. Money to run the IETF comes from meeting fees, a bunch of meeting fees. You pay, pay to go to face-to-face -face meetings. You don't pay to go uh, to be on mailing lists and things, but there's meeting fees, and those meeting fees are s set in order to cover more than just the cost of the meeting. They're set to help pay for the secretariat as well. There's also sponsors for individual meetings, as hosts and other kinds of sponsors for the meetings, and they put money into the budget as well. And then ISOC covers, it ranges up to about a third of the budget of the IETF. It's contributed by ISOC itself through ISOC's own resources. The IASA is responsible for all of the IETF's finances, not just the budget, but contracting and things like that to decide on what, what functions they're going to have others do, like new software development and like. They contract, the IASA contracts for the support functions, such as the secretariat, the RFC editors, and things like that, groups like that. The actual contracts are written by the Internet Society because the IETF and the IASA are not legal entities, but the work is done by the IASA. The IASA includes the administrator director, who is an ISOC employee, is the one who actually works out the contracts and things like that. There's an administrative oversight committee, the IAOC, a group that I've been on in the past. It's an eight-member body which has some positional memberships, which the IAB and IETF chairs and the ISOC president are all there because of they have a, a role that they're playing. So it, independent of who the IETF chair is, the current IETF chair is a member of the, uh, the IOC. In addition to that, there's some members that are selected by the IETF NOMCOM, two, by the IAB, one, ISG, one, and the Internet Society Board, one. They, together they make up the IOC and they're the ones who adopt the actual budget and adopt the actual meeting locations and things like that. There was an IETF trust. It was created in, in 2005 to hold whatever IPR, intellectual property rights, the IETF might have. Now there's some copyright on RFCs. Talk about copyright separately, but the IETF has copyright on the actual format of the RFCs and what is actually published. The, the author of the RFC has the remaining copyrights on the contents itself, but the IETF has the right, the, the right to publish this document in perpetuity. Uh, and that kind, that, that's the kind of rights that are held by the, by the, um, 
the IETF trust. Any domain names, any trademarks, any work that's been done for hire, software developed, things like that. Any IPR that's created under IETF contracts are part of the trust. The trust is not a patent pool. Um, it is a, it's a organiz it's a function which is just holding IPR. And it has produced a document which describes for the IETF community how to deal with the, tra the, the copyright um, rights within IETF documents and other kinds of rights like trademarks and stuff within the IETF documents such as RFCs and internet drafts. And you can find that legal provisions relating to the IETF documents on the, I the IASA website.